here we have Jupiter. Now it formed with the rest of our solar system around 4.6 billion years ago. Shortly after its formation, it was surrounded by a disk of gas and dust, and many of its moons were formed here. Now the one we want to focus on today is the largest of them. And in fact, it is the largest moon in our whole solar system, Ganymede. Now, if you are wondering, man on the internet, how did this moon form? Or maybe what is it like today? Or what do we currently know about it? Well, you have come to the right place. As in this video, we will be answering these questions and more. Subnebula. I had not encountered this term before researching for this video. Now, as hinted at earlier, it is a phenomenon that occurs around a giant planet during formation as it accretes material and as its atmosphere contracts. Solar wind can play a factor in the forming of the subnebula as well. It consists of an inner region and an outer region, and for today, we will be focusing on the inner region as that is where Ganymede formed. The accretion process of the moon probably took around 10,000 years, and this rapid formation led to a couple of outcomes. The first of which is much of the heat generated from its accretion would have remained trapped in its core. This in turn led to the second outcome, which is the moon's differentiation. Basically, heat from the core slowly radiated outwards, first encountering the icy mantle, then through convection, this heat was transferred to the moon's surface. This combined with additional heat being generated in the core by the decay of radioactive material, caused the elements within Ganymede to separate into different areas or layers within the moon itself. This is what makes it differentiated. To go forward, let us have a look at each of these layers. Starting with the core of Ganymede. It is rich in iron and nickel and has a radius of up to around 500 kilometers. The core is hot as well, likely around 1500 to 1700 Kelvin, which sits around 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, some of the iron found in the core is liquid and as such undergoes convection, not unlike the core of the Earth. This is likely what generates the magnetic field that Galileo detected around Ganymede, uh, and we will talk more about that later in this video. For now, let us move up to the next layer, which is the rocky mantle. This is a spherical shell of silicate material that is most likely composed of more iron and chondrites. The second one we believe to be like L slash LL ordinary chondrites, and what this implies is that most of the iron found in the mantle is iron oxide, with much smaller amounts of total and metallic iron. We also see this type of chondrite in meteorites. Moving on to the next part, let's first turn back the clock to the 1970s and have a look at NASA. Scientists there at the time began to model Ganymede, which led them to suspect that the moon had a subsurface ocean trapped between two layers of ice. By 1990, we were investigating this more directly with Galileo as it flew by Ganymede. This is what would come to confirm the subsurface ocean for us and showing us that it extends to depths of hundreds of miles. Like there's a lot of water in there, probably more than we have here on Earth. Galileo also found evidence for salt content within the water, likely magnesium sulfate. Then, in 2014, things got even more interesting. With suspected salt in the oceans, the modeling changed. This brought us an analysis which indicated that Ganymede might have more than one ocean layer, separated by layers with different phases of ice something of a club sandwich, if you will. This change in thinking came not just from the salt though, but more specifically how it interacts with liquids 
under more extreme conditions. So when salts were added to the bottles under such pressures that you'd find in, in like in a moon, scientists were presented with liquids dense enough to sink all the way down to the ocean floor. This created an opportunity for there to be a saltwater ocean layer that sits right above the rocky mantle. There's a chance that this formation never came together, or that if it did, that it hasn't remained stable, but if it is still there, it presents potential conditions for life to form, because it would have heat energy coming from the core, potential vents in the rocky mantle to eject this heat into the ocean, which would also add nutrients into the water, creating a solution for microbes to form. This is not unlike the conditions that we think Europa might have. Now, above however many ice and ocean layers there may be, sits the crust and surface of Ganymede. Before we talk about the surface features of Ganymede, I want to go over its size, because as I mentioned earlier, it is the largest and most massive moon in our solar system, topping even Saturn's moon Titan. Its diameter is 5,270 kilometers, which is around 3,270 miles, and its mass in tons is 1.48 times 10 to the power of 20. This number is 148 followed by 20 zeros. Now, I was today years old when I learned that this is what sextillion means. So if we were to quantify this in your average vehicle, it would be like taking 74 sextillion of them and smashing them into a large sphere. Ganymede dwarfs our moon, like completely, and in terms of size, even Mercury, which is around 4,879 kilometers, Keep in mind, though, that Ganymede is around 45% less massive than Mercury. Now, how about its surface? It has a fairly high albedo, reflecting 43% of the light that hits it. This can be attributed to the large amount of water ice found on its surface, with a mass fraction of 50 to 90%. The albedo is quite asymmetrical, though, with its leading hemisphere being brighter than its trailing one. Much of this is due to the trailing hemisphere appearing to be enriched with other elements, such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and possibly cyanogen, hydrogen sulfate, along with various organic compounds. We know this from near infrared and UV spectra taken by both the Galileo spacecraft, and from observations taken here on Earth. The surface has a mix of two types of terrain. Now, while they are both ancient, right, all these things are really old, one is older than the other. The dark and highly cratered regions are older, while the lighter, less cratered regions are younger. The dark terrain contains clays and organic materials, and these may have come from the original impacts and impactors that led to the formation of the Jovian moons. If we look here, we can see that its terrain is grooved as well. The heating mechanism that led to this is not currently known, but it is believed to be tectonic in nature. Now, what sits above Ganymede's surface? To begin, we will go over its potential tenuous oxygen atmosphere. In 1972, Jupiter and Ganymede passed in front of a background star in what is known as an occultation. As the star's visible light passed around Ganymede, a team of astronomers from Britain, America, and India studied it from here on Earth using spectroscopy. And India thought they had detected a thin atmosphere from these data. Come 1979, we had a chance to study this more directly when the Voyager spacecraft did its flyby of Jupiter. It took measurements in the far ultraviolet wavelength, which is more sensitive to gases than visible light, and this time, no such atmosphere was detected. So then why did I mention earlier that we thought it had one? 
Is this the end? Negative. Come 1995, we would study Ganymede yet again using the Hubble Space Telescope and also in the ultraviolet wavelengths, and it found something different. Hubble observed an airglow of atomic oxygen around Ganymede, like what we see with Europa. This is likely the source that the oxygen comes from, and this happens when radiation is hitting its surface, right? Hydrogen and oxygen are split off. Because the hydrogen is much lighter, it is blown away by the solar wind, but the oxygen can linger, leaving behind Ganymede's thin atmosphere. Now, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but Ganymede is unique from all the other moons in our solar system in another way. This is because it has its own magnetic field that is separate from Jupiter's. We learned this from the Galileo spacecraft when it made six close flybys of the Jovian moon. Now, in electromagnetism, the magnetic moment of an object is its combined strength and orientation. This applies to magnets and to objects that exert a magnetic field. For Ganymede, its moment is three times stronger than Mercury's. And dang, I just realized that's two wins for Ganymede over Mercury now. Like here on Earth, this magnetic field causes Ganymede to have aurora as well. These aurora are caused by interactions with Jupiter's plasma, not unlike how the sun interacts with our magnetic field here on Earth to create our aurora. The plasma flow is slower here though, as it only has subsonic speeds, whereas coming from the sun, they are supersonic speeds. Because of this, no bow shock occurs on the trailing end of Ganymede. While we suspect its magnetic field is generated by its core, how the core is still hot enough to have liquid parts remains enigmatic. One possible explanation is from tidal heating caused by the orbital resonances it undergoes, which we will touch on next. Ganymede orbits Jupiter at a distance of 1,070,400 kilometers which is 655,100 miles. And it is the third among the Galilean satellites. It completes one revolution around its host planet in seven days and three hours. Like most known moons in our solar system, it is also tidally locked, meaning it is always facing Jupiter with the same side. Ganymede's orbit is also slightly eccentric, meaning it is not a circle, but more of an oval and is inclined or tilted towards the Jovian equator. Both of these factors can change due to solar and planetary gravitational perturbation, but this change occurs on the time scale of centuries. Ganymede is also in an orbital resonance with both Io and Europa. For every orbit it completes, Europa completes two orbits and Io completes four orbits. The type of resonance the moons are in is known as the Laplace resonance. This means that it involves three orbiting bodies, Ganymede, Europa, and Io, where the orbital periods are in a specific ratio. Throughout this video, I have mentioned a couple of missions that have really helped us study Ganymede more directly. The main two being Voyager 1 and Galileo. And right now, we even have the Juno spacecraft, which is in its extended mission around Jupiter, helping us study the moon as well. But there is an upcoming mission that I would like to touch on while we are here. And this is JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Launched in 2023 by ESA, it is currently en route to the Jovian system and is set to arrive in July of 2031. While it is designed to study all three of the large icy moons, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede, its primary focus is going to be on Ganymede. JUICE will be helping us learn more about the makeup and structure of the internal oceans, how it differs from the other two icy moons, more about how its magnetic field is generated and kept up, 
and how that magnetic field interacts with Jupiter's. Part of how it will be able to help us learn so much is that during its mission, it will jump from Jupiter and begin orbiting Ganymede, making it among the first spacecraft to orbit a moon other than our own. On the screen, we can see the instruments that JUICE will use to help us study all of these things, and I will be leaving the link to ESA's website on this in the description if you would like to read more about it. Nearly every time I make a video, I learn something that I did not know before, and this one is no different. While Ganymede admittedly is not among my favorite moons, it is still a lot more fascinating than I thought going in. I do really think it is cool that it is unique in having its own magnetic field as well. Uh, and I am very curious to see what more we can learn by studying it overall. I am happy to know that we have both a mission there right now and a mission lined up to reach it in the future that we'll be studying it further. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. And what is your favorite part about Ganymede? I would love to hear more about it in the comments below. With that, let us all step outside tonight and look towards the stars.